Hello friends, I'm Ashish Tabari, founder and CEO of Axamize, and to our new listeners, we're very welcome to our old ones. Welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic, visible and invisible formal verification. So last week, we talked about abstraction under seven minutes to present an intuitive view of abstracting away the final details of implementation in the context of formal verification. Of course, the podcast itself was rather abstract. And uh, of course, you're welcome to join me in a deep dive uh, on this topic of abstractions in the webinar on 11th of February on the ABC of formal verification. If you haven't already registered, go to axiomize.com forward slash webinars and register. Okay, if you're building silicon that will end up in a car or a plane or in a connected device, maybe you should consider investing in formal methods as they are the only way of establishing proof of good behavior and prove that bad behavior does not exist. If you're building silicon that isn't going to be connected to anything else, Perhaps you should ask yourself why you're building the silicon anyways. If this piece of silicon ends up in a connected device, perhaps you should worry about verifying it for security. If the silicon ends up in a car or a plane, perhaps you need to think of reliability even more if not the mandatory compliance with the ISO standards. Formal methods are the only way of establishing proof of bug absence. Haven't I already told you this today? Okay, so let us understand why we're actually talking about this topic. So formal methods is a great way of establishing proof of bug absence. In fact, they are the only way of establishing bug absence through a mathematical proof. So let us understand how proofs are computed and when they are visible and when they are not. So let us take a step back and ask this question, what is a proof of bug absence? So we can say that we have a proof of bug absence when we can show the existence of a proof that the design does not have the buggy behavior where the behavior itself was modeled as a precise mathematical property or a lemma or a theorem. The behavior itself can either express positive intent or a negative intent. A positive intent can be something like, in the context of a RISC-V processor, all load instructions in a RISC-V core must execute and complete correctly. An example of bad behavior can be something like a processor supporting misaligned loads and stores must not raise exceptions when a misaligned load or store is issued. So let us look at theorem proving, where the entire field of formal methods actually, especially the modern formal methods, uh, took its roots. So traditionally, the field of formal grew in theorem proving, and the key strategy in building mathematical proofs relies on formalizing requirements, as I just said, as target goals. So in the context of theorem proving, unless we have proven something, it's a goal. So it's a target goal, where goal is a logically precise formalism that expresses the intent using constructions of mathematical logic. Now, you may have heard of things like first-order logic, higher-order logic, temporal logic, linear time logic, computation tree logic, or you may have actually just heard of SVA and PSL type languages, which are examples of LTL. Now, the motivation in using any of these logics is to capture the intent or behavior precisely. The precision part of it is important. The behavior itself can be non-time dependent or time dependent. And this is a standard practice in theorem proving a classic field of formal methods. We define basic properties of your underlying domain. And you know we kind of call this a modeling exercise and then pose questions of this model by writing our target goals, which we then end up proving as lemmas or theorems that capture the intended characteristics of this model. 
At a very high level, there are two basic techniques for building proofs in theorem provers. One is deduction and the other is induction. With deduction, the proof is constructed by applying logical inference rules of the underlying logic or by exploiting what is called a decision procedure, which is an automatic way of inferencing correctness without user-guided recipes. A very simple rule valid in many logics is that if we know A and that A implies B, then we can infer B. For example, we know from experience that if it is sunny, it is likely to be warm. We can conclude it is warm if we know for sure that it is sunny. We simply applied the transitive rule of inference to deduce this. If you know A and if A then B, then we know B if we knew A. You may have used this line of reasoning already in your high school maths and proofs or geometry or algebra. Induction is another commonly used method of building proofs. You may have come across it as well in high school when proving simple math theorems on number series, for example. Induction, quite simply, is a proof by generalization. Suppose we set out to prove a simple property in positive integers that for all positive integers n, n is always less than its successor, that is n plus 1. We first have to prove that the base case is true, and then we prove the step case. Think of base case as the easiest case. So in this case, the n uh, will be 1, as this is the smallest positive integer. And it would be then easy to say that 1 is less than 2. We can prove that. It follows from the laws of arithmetic. The step case proofs by making use of what is known as an induction hypothesis, where we assume that the target goal is true for any arbitrary value. And then if we can prove that goal for its successor, then we can generalize that it is true for all values. So for the proof in question that for all n, the number n is less than n plus 1, provided n is a positive integer, we can assume that this is valid for some arbitrary positive integer m. So we now know that m is less than m plus 1 by induction hypothesis. We can then set out to prove that m plus 1 is less than m plus 2, which will then follow from the induction hypothesis and the laws of arithmetic. See, if you were doing simulation-based verification of this formula and you wanted to test if this formula is valid, you will be testing the validity of this formula by instantiating this n with all possible positive integer values, which is an infinite set. So when are you exactly finished then? Well, that is if you were doing an exhaustive verification. So induction is a great way of conquering proof complexity and provides a way to compute proofs for data structures of arbitrary sizes. In fact, most are improving when done with proof tools that are called theorem provers do not suffer from any capacity issues. Another great asset of computing proofs this way is that we can visualize the steps of the proofs, see it for ourselves, and another interested person can review it too. However, if during a proof we are stuck not knowing how to resolve it, there is not too much in the way of knowing automatically what to do to make more progress. The formal user does have to know the maths as well as enough of underlying domain knowledge to get going. For the easy example I just talked about, almost everyone knows the property or numbers, so it isn't an issue. But for a more complex problem, discovering supporting lemmas and arguments is non-trivial. Another deficiency of theorem proving, if I may say that, is that we cannot tell if we have enough lemmas and theorems. How do we know that we have done enough? So in short, theorem provers are great because they don't have capacity issues, the proofs are visible, but not much in the way of providing automatic feedback or coverage. So let's jump to property checking, which is another way of doing formal methods and is a highly popular way in industry. In property checking, we express target lemmas as assertions, you know, can be expressed in system metalog assertion language or PSL or some other property specification language that is capable of expressing time-dependent behavior. We therefore can write assertions calling them target lemmas, if you like, under a set of assumptions, environmental conditions, basically, they express what is and isn't true of the environment. 
and either prove or disprove that assertions hold on the design implementation. In the context of formal property checking, the concept of a proof is central, just as it is in theorem proving. But the exact mechanics of how these proofs are computed differ from theorem provers. The proof in the case of property checkers is built by using a host of techniques from explicit state search to symbolic executions, massaging BDD and SAT solvers, SMT solvers, induction, bounded model checking, and whatnot. I, I wouldn't go into the details of any of these today. One key distinction with property checking is that the proof computation is automatic. So as opposed to theorem proving, the entire proof computation in property checking is completely automatic. And if a given assert does not prove for the design, one gets feedback in the form of a debug trace, which can be then debugged to find out the root cause of the problem. Additionally, through coverage, we can determine if what we are proving is enough or not. Again, not going into these details today, but feel free to listen in to my earlier podcast on six dimensions of coverage and formal, or come to the webinar on 11th, or even better take our training uh, where we go into these details in much, much more depth. Property checking in general suffers from capacity issues and mastering the methodology to achieve a scalability and predictability is important. Key areas where we excel at Aximize and provide extensive training and support to our customers. Now, another interesting aspect of property checking is that the property checkers or model checkers, as they're also called, do tell us when there is a proof, but we cannot see them. The actual proof is invisible from the user. So all we get to know is that there exists a proof because there is a green tick in the tool. Some other day I will talk about how to fix this problem. I have spoken about this to numerous EDA companies, uh, but so far we've not seen a, a solution yet. The end result, however, of seeing evidence of this proof is that, okay, the user cannot see what the proof is, or why a proof is a proof, although in, in many cases, tools can give you what they call a witness trace, an example to say why a proof was a proof, but not the complete picture of why the proof was a proof. So the end result of this is a mathematical proof that a user cannot see, but knows that it exists because the tools mark them as a valid proof. But whenever this computation is completed and we get a definite outcome, proof or a fail, we can say we have an exhaustive outcome. If the proof tool runs out of time or compute power and the outcome is not known for sure to be a proof or a failure, then we have a non-exhaustive outcome, which is also called inconclusive proof, also sometimes known as a bounded proof, which actually I really don't like, as it suggests we have a proof when we don't really have one. I would like to point out though that through, sorry, beg your pardon, though the proofs in property checking are not visible to the user, property checking tools do show coverage for the properties proven and demonstrate through metrics what percentage of the design was covered by the proofs. A remarkable advancement in the area of property checking in the last decade, in my opinion. Also note that there's no such thing as we have proven the design correct. That statement doesn't mean anything, neither in property checking nor in theorem proving. The quality of a proof is only as good as the assertions, the target goal, the target lemma that you started out to prove, and the constraints on the system under which the proof was built. And the proofs only make sense when we know what they're proving and under which conditions they hold. So to recap, formal proofs in property checking are built automatically by using search techniques and symbolic executions. They do have capacity issues, which can be circumvented with great methodology. And though we cannot see why a proof in a property checker is a proof and they remain invisible, we can certainly determine if we have enough proofs and properties by exploiting coverage. So while I focus today so much on proofs, it is important to reiterate another great facet of property checking. And the greatest asset in building assertions for formal verification is that we can use them for bug hunting. Running these inside a formal tool to obtain corner case bugs, especially for control and concurrency dominated designs, 
though it does not exclude data path intensive floating point and integer designs. Have I said that properties can also be used as documentation and can be rerun in simulation and emulation? Yes, these are other reasons why I love Formula. When properties fail, we do not have a proof, but we certainly have a visible evidence in the form of an example waveform that can be used to understand what is broken and a fix can therefore be applied to obtain a proof. With property checking often the path to failure is quite short and the bring up time in writing assertions and embarking on formal ABV is a fraction of simulation based verification, mainly because all an FE engineer needs to think of is assumes, asserts and covers based on the requirements and stimulus is free. No single second is wasted in writing input stimulus. Let me say one more thing about proof and fails. The ability of the tools to find bugs or build proofs of bug absence is linked to each other, though in many cases, finding bugs is often easier than building proofs of bug absence. In our view, we see these exercises as part of the continuum that we've captured in our Adept FV flow, which you should check out on axmize.com and in the blogs that we have written. Okay, so let me wrap up for today, but Close this thread by saying that property checking and theorem proving are not the only two ways of building proofs and establishing strong confidence in verification. Equivalence checking is the third dimension for obtaining exhaustive proofs. It's also widely used in the industry. And having said that, we are verifying designs today with hundreds of millions of flip-flops today with great property checking assisted with great scalable methodology. Okay, so friends, if you're interested in exploring any of these topics in more detail, join us for a free webinar on the 11th of February, or come and get our world-class methodology-oriented problem-solving-based training, and we'll teach you what we practice as we practice what we teach. And we love sharing our experiences, so come and join the fun. Till then, I wish you all the best, and we will be back next week. Stay connected.